I do my best to live my life with kindness, with compassion, and with mindfulness, allowing myself to have my feelings the way they are and responding to them in the way that's most helpful in the moment and allowing people around me to do the same. You have to have their feelings the way they are, sometimes helping them respond uh, to those feelings in the best possible way, but really just respecting uh, every person's experience, validating it, allowing it to be uh, to be real and really kind of starting with that. There is no experience that's invalid. The idea is to respond with kindness and with compassion to whatever the person is going through. Hey, my friends, this is Nishant and welcome to the Nishant Girl Show. This is a podcast about helping you live a fulfilled life. And the mission of the show is to spread mindfulness awareness. And my job on the show is to invite world-class experts to extract the practices, routines, and habits to help you live a fulfilled and abundant life. Today's guest is Ina Kazan. Ina Kazan is a faculty member at Harvard Medical School where she teaches and supervises trainees. A clinical psychologist specializing in health psychology and performance excellence training using biofeedback and mindfulness-based approaches. Dr. Kazan also maintains a private practice in Boston where working with clients on optimizing their health and performance. Recognized as a pioneer in mindfulness-based biofeedback, Dr. Kazan is a popular speaker at national and international conferences on the topics of biofeedback and mindfulness. She has conducted biofeedback and mindfulness trainings for notable institutions in the U.S. and abroad, including the U.S. Navy Spatial Warfare, U.S. Army Spatial Forces. Dr. Kazan is the author of numerous journal articles, the highly regarded clinical handbook of biofeedback, a step-by-step guide to training and practice with mindfulness, and the newly released book, Biofeedback and Mindfulness in Everyday Life, Practical Solutions for Improving Your Health and Performance. Without further ado, please enjoy this wide-ranging conversation on mindfulness-based biofeedback, meditations, performance improvements, and much, much more. Ina, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Nishant. My pleasure. What did you have in the breakfast today? <laughs> so far, my breakfast has just been a cup of coffee, but I'm uh, p- planning on correcting that after our conversation. What kind of coffee do you drink? Oh, uh, you ask tough questions. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I have a wonderful Nespresso machine that has made my mornings much easier. You know, pop in a pod and you know, there we go. I Is there any specific coffee? coffee? Is there any specific coffee brand that you prefer? Well, Nespresso, Nespresso has its own brand, but the particular the particular name of the pod I like is Ristretto. I see. If you're in a social gathering and somebody asks you what you do for a living, Ina, how would you describe that? Well, I am a clinical psychologist. That's my primary uh, professional role. I work with people who have both um, health-related issues, so things like chronic pain, anxiety, headaches, and I'm also a performance psychologist, which means that I work with people who are interested in doing what they do better, so athletes, musicians, executives, attorneys, surgeons, anybody who is interested in improving their professional performance. I am also a teacher and a mentor um, and a scientist, so a bunch of stuff in one bag you are also into mindfulness based therapy as well right the, so my primary way of working with people and the way of you know teaching is mindfulness based uh, uh, approaches and psychophysiologically based approaches such as biofeedback what is psychophysiological approach So this is where we take into account uh, the way that the body works and the way that the mind works and the way that they work together. So biofeedback is a great way for us to get to know how uh, the body is functioning physiologically at any moment, you know, starting from, you know, neutral times when people are just at baseline doing nothing in particular uh, to uh, stressful times to recovery times. And we measure physiological uh, parameters such as heart rate and heart rate variability, breathing, muscle tension. Etc. And it gives us a really important glimpse at how the body is working and how the body is able to regulate itself. Uh, and then, based on that information, we can help people train the areas of physiology that could function uh, a little bit better. 
We'll definitely get into the weeds of biofeedback. And mm-hmm. before that, I would love to ask you, how did you get into mindfulness after studying clinical psychology? Wow. So I originally was introduced to mindfulness actually in the context of doing my biofeedback training. I was in graduate school. I was doing my training at uh, Cambridge Hospital in, in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I did a biofeedback training. I loved it. I was doing it with most patients that I, that I had. It was you know, making a really big difference for most people. But every once in a while, I would encounter people with whom we would just get stuck in the biofeedback training. Let's say they are, you know, trying to raise their finger temperature and, you know, they're trying so hard that instead of finger temperature, you know, going up, it's actually going down or they're, or they're you know, fighting so hard with their breathing that they're feeling breathless and uh, uh, really uncomfortable. So in trying to figure that out, I... Uh, was talking to my wonderful mindfulness and self-compassion mentor, Christopher Germer. And uh, what I, you know occurred in that conversation is that by trying to change the present moment with biofeedback, people are actually achieving the opposite of what they're trying to achieve. They're trying to fight with what is not changeable in that moment. And they're wasting all their resources on something that's not going to change. So by using uh, mindfulness, I was able to help people let go of the struggle and let go of fighting with uh, their you know, physiological reactions and let go of uh, trying to fight with how they feel and what they think. Uh, and instead, uh, focus on allowing the moment to be as it, as it is so that they can direct uh, their resources towards making the kinds of changes that they're actually uh, possible to make. Uh, so when people stop fighting with their breath, uh, they started being able to breathe and make the kinds of changes that they were looking for, for example. Uh, so it's a really powerful introduction to mindfulness that really changed both my professional and personal life, you know, as I um, started uh, uh, practicing uh, mindfulness meditation and just you know, uh, living daily life in a much more uh, mindful way. How long ago did you get into mindfulness? Uh, oh, it's been a long time. It's been about 17 years. That's a long time. Good, good amount of time. Yeah. <laughs> How would you, I'm curious, you know, I'm, I'm, into, I'm deep into this ignorance pool of biofeedback. Could you explain biofeedback in non-scientific way for our listeners? Sure. So with biofeedback, we have instruments that measure uh, certain parameters of physiology, such as heart rate, heart durability, uh, breathing, muscle tension, finger temperature. And then it display those instruments display those physiological parameters on the computer screen. So you can see in real time, you know, what's going on with your heart rate and what, you know, what is your breathing doing and how tense are your muscles and, you know, how warm or cold your hands are, things like that. And, you know, we can run some assessments. We can figure out, you know, how does your body respond to stress and how does your body re- respond to recovery? And, you know, this is a really good way for us to learn how your body functions at neutral times, at stressful times, and it gives us an idea of uh, how we can help the body and the mind mind function better uh, in a moment of challenge and how we can help the body and mind recover you know once uh, challenges uh, are over or once just the day is over and it's time uh, for recovery uh, so the way the training happens is uh, you know, people are looking in real time at the computer screen, figuring out, you know, how what they're doing or thinking uh, or feeling is affecting uh, what they're seeing on the screen and then learning how to make helpful, mindful changes without a struggle to what they're seeing uh, on the screen and ultimately training their body to uh, improve its ability to regulate its activation so that the body learns how to activate to just an optimal level when needed and then how to uh, reduce that activation and recover fully uh, when activation is uh, no longer necessary. And when do we need this biofeedback training? I'm, I'm curious to know that if I am struggling with anxiety or any sort of chronic pain or any sort of thing in my life, then when should I do this training and how should I get into this training? Biofeedback is something that can be useful to pretty much anybody. Certainly, you know, people who have chronic pain, anxiety, depression, more medical disorders such as, such as high blood pressure or Raynaud's, headaches, all of these, all, all, all of these, you know, physiologically, psychophysiologically based disorders have been shown to be really helpful 
So with biofeedback is a really a powerful tool to work with a large number of disorders, and it's really it can be helpful to people who are totally healthy and you know don't have uh, disorders or issues affecting their lives. But you know people who struggle with things like anxiety or depression or have a trauma history, or those who have chronic pain, um, headaches, and more medical disorders, you know such as high blood pressure or Raynaud's disease uh, or asthma. Biofeedback has been shown to be an effective treatment for all of these disorders. It also, people who would like to just improve um, um, their life in general, those who would like to improve their professional athletic performance can benefit from biofeedback as well. Um, and the way to get into it is there's, a, there's actually a number of ways. Uh, you can do something as simple as you know, getting an app on your phone. There are apps that will you know, measure your um, heart durability, you know, right from the camera on your phone. Very, very simple. It may not necessarily be uh, you know, the, most, the most accurate way to measure, but it will certainly give you a fairly uh, good idea of uh, what's going on. And then you can, from there, advance to user-friendly, fairly inexpensive devices that maybe connect to your phone or standalone or connect to your computer and can help you assess you know, things like heart rate variability. And if you're interested in um, something more comprehensive, particularly if you really are um, interested in working on some of those psychophysiological issues such as chronic pain or anxiety or depression, uh, or if you're really interested in improving your performance and taking it to the next level, then working with a a biofeedback uh, practitioner, so somebody who is board certified in biofeedback and you know has equipment that can measure a variety of different uh, physiological functions um, at the same time and with very high grade, reliable, powerful equipment. Um, you know that will give you um, the best. That will give you the best training. So if you're looking for somebody to uh, work on uh, biofeedback with, um, you can go to Biofeedback Certification International Alliance webpage BCI. A.org um, and click on find a practitioner and you will find uh, uh, people in your area who are certified in biofeedback uh, and can help you uh, do the kind of comprehensive uh, training that will that would help you work on whether it be anxiety, pain uh, or headaches or help you improve your professional performance. If I understand correctly, that there are three ways. One is we can install some apps in our phone. And second is we can go to a biofeedback practitioner. And third is to buy some devices. What are those apps and devices? If you could name that, please. I can give you a few. I am, you know, this is certainly not going to be a comprehensive list. There is a variety of different apps and devices out there, but I will give you uh, an idea of a um, few yes, of them. Please. So for an app that just uses uh, the phone camera to measure your um, heart rate variability, there is Camera HRV, and there is an app, app called HRV Camera. They are different apps, but they, they do um, similar things. There is uh, also an app called Heart Rate Coherence Pro. And uh, so those are just some examples of the ones that use uh, um, the camera straight from the phone. If you are interested in getting a device that's going to give you a little more information and will give you uh, a little bit more options for how to work with this, some examples are Thought Technologies eView TPS. It's a device that goes on your finger and connects to your uh, phone and can measure heart rate variability, temperature, and skin conductance. There is also a device called iFeel by uh, Somatic Vision that uses a live software and also measure your heart rate variability and connect to your phone or your computer um, and allow you to uh, play video games, uh, training your <laughs> training your physiology. So it's quite fun. And there is also Elite uh, HRV, uh, which has a device called the CoreSense, which also goes on your finger and connects to your phone and allows you to monitor and uh, train your um, heart rate variability. How do you measure or i should ask you what happens after after we have done the biofeedback training once we have all the numbers and figures what does the next step look like well uh, biofeedback training is something that's ideally um, done uh, for 
you know, maybe lifelong, the same as with meditation, right? When, when we first learn meditation, you know, we may you know, need to ramp up in order to be able to have a regular practice. Uh, but once the regular practice is established, it's in our best interest to continue that regular practice. Because if we stop, the benefits of meditation do eventually dissipate. It's the same thing with biofeedback. You know, once we uh, ramp up to about you know, 20 minutes a day uh, practice, the idea is to uh, continue doing that because what you're doing is you're continuously uh, improving your body's ability to self-regulate. It's similar to, you know, if you were to go to the gym and do some strength training, right? If you were, I don't know, lug some kettlebells or, you know, lift some dumbbells, etc. time you uh, do your workout, your muscle strength increases, but you have to uh, continue going to the gym on a regular basis in order to be able to maintain uh, the gains that you're making, right? If you stop going to the gym, eventually that uh, those gains are going to disappear. Again, it's the same thing with uh, biofeedback and with mindfulness, you know, they're, you know, a workout for your nervous system, a workout for your brain um, that you need to continue on a regular basis. So it's, it's an ongoing practice mm-hmm. every day. How do you combine mindfulness and feedback in your life, in your personal life? <laughs> uh, well, I, I've started doing, you know, by feedback for myself, you know, many, many years ago, you know, 17, 18 years. And at this point, it's just become a part of, you know, a part of what I do. How I, since I've incorporated mindfulness practice into my biofeedback practice, I, you know, when I do my, you know, daily or almost daily uh, meditation practice in, in incorporates elements of, uh, of biofeedback. Occasionally, I will use an actual um, instrument, you know, maybe, you know, once a week, I'll include an instrument to actually see, you know, how I'm doing and track my progress. But at this point, a lot of the time, I may not need uh, an instrument uh, anymore because I've learned to I'll understand my body's uh, reaction. And, you know, this is where really you know, mindfulness comes in in such a helpful way. Um, I've learned to become aware of, you know, when I am in that you know, optimal training zone as far as biofeedback um, is concerned. And, you know, I use instruments not as regularly uh, as I used to because I no longer need that direct feedback. And that's something that I hope for the people I work with. And initially, we need a lot of feedback from instruments. And as as people grow and improve their practice, the feedback from instruments becomes something that they need you know, once, twice a week to make sure that they are continuing on the right um, track. So when I do my heart rate variability training, which is done uh, mainly through the breath, right, it becomes a uh, uh, mindful breathing meditation, but done in a way that also trains my heart rate variability. So breathing at a, uh, at a certain rate, but mindfully, right? So it combines uh, uh, elements of biofeedback and uh, mindfulness all at once. There are many kinds of breathing exercises. What kind of breathing exercise do you perform every day? Um, so heart rate variability breathing is what I do um, on a daily basis. And you're right, there are so many different options out there. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so if very often people ask me, oh, which one do I choose and which one is better? It's a little bit hard to answer that question. It sort of does depend on your goal. I will tell you that heart rate variability biofeedback breathing um, is consistently um, shown in high quality research to be uh, very effective in improving self-regulation, improving symptoms of disorders that I've mentioned, such as anxiety, depression, headaches, chronic pain, etc., and also helping people improve their performance. So that is what I do. <laughs> and uh, the way to find out what kind of breathing to do for heart rate variability, you can do one of two things. Either go to a uh, professional or get the kind of equipment that will help you determine that optimal breathing rate that will maximize your heart rate variability. That optimal breathing rate is different for uh, different people, and it usually lies somewhere between four and a half and seven breaths per minute You know, with a, a proper biofeedback instrument. But you can determine exactly which breathing rate uh, is the correct one for you. And if that is uh, not, um, not possible or not something that's possible right now, what you can do is breathe at six breaths per minute. For most people, that gets close enough. You know, research shows that there is some benefit in figuring out your actual optimal breathing rate. It's called uh, resonance frequency breathing rate. So there is a, definitely a benefit in going that route. But if that's not possible, then breathing at six breaths per minute will get you close enough. So the way you would do that breathing is to breathe in for four seconds and breathe out 
for six um, seconds and they're actually uh, breath pacers that you can also get on your mobile device that will help you pace your breathing that way. It's, it's not by a feedback because it's just a pacer. It's not giving you any information about what's happening in your body, but it will help you pace your breathing uh, in the way that will you know, start helping you to improve your heart variability and self-regulation. You know, so some of these pacers, may, there's something called an app called Breathe with an E at the end, or a breathe to relax with a breathe number to relax. Those are some options for, for pacers that will uh, allow you to set um, your uh, breath in for four and breath out for six. Another app uh, is called uh, Paced Breathing, for example, will also do um, the same thing um, for you. Would you mind giving us a small demo of how to count six breathings? <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So I'm going to, you know, guide guide you through. This is this kind of breathing is going to be quite a bit slower than most people are uh, used to. So for some uh, for some of your listeners, you know, uh, getting back get into six breaths per minute will be um, fine and comfortable. But if for um, some people breathing at six breaths per minute is not comfortable right away, you know, that's not a cause for concern. Don't be discouraged. It's just sometimes. Uh, take some time to be able to slow down to breathing that slowly just because you're not used to doing that. So I will guide you through the six breaths per minute uh, breathing, but just remember that it might uh, take a little while to become comfortable with that. So the way to do this breathing, a couple of things to remember. One is we are not focusing on a deep breath. Uh, I'm actually going to encourage you not to try to take a deep breath. You're going to take a normal size, comfortable breath in. I will encourage you to shift your breath from the chest down to the belly. It might help to imagine a balloon in your belly. So with every breath in, you're gently inflating the balloon. And with every breath out, you're gently deflating um, the balloon, right? Allowing the air to kind of come in and go out without, without effort. But by shifting the breath from the chest to the belly, it will deepen your breath just enough so that, you know, you, you can sustain that slower breathing rate, but there is no need to take really big breaths. So uh, as far as the size of the breath goes, um, allow it to be a normal size uh, breath in. Your body knows, you know, just how much um, air um, to, to take in. So let your body do that for you. And then for the breath out, uh, you're either going to uh, breathe out through the nose. That is optimal to breathe out through the nose. But again, when you're slowing down your breathing quite, quite this much, it may be hard to slow down your exhalation through the nose initially. So you may exhale through the mouth, uh, through pursed lips, never through an open big, uh, big mouth, but just through pursed lips as if you are blowing out a candle. All right, you're ready to do this together? Yes, please. All right. So I'm going to breathe in and out. In, out. Breathe in. And breathe out. In, out. In, out. Breathe in. Breathe out. So there you go. It's a, it's a, this is a little bit harder to do when I'm, you know, when I'm talking. Uh, it, you'll probably have an easier time uh, pacing if you're doing your own count or if you are um, using a, um, you know, your phone pacer. But hopefully, this gave you an idea of what that breathing looks like. Yeah, I love it. Thank you so much for that. So, is there any specific posture we have to be in for this practice? 
Ideally, a uh, well, first, most importantly, a comfortable posture. <laughs> That's really important. Your uh, diaphragm, so the muscle that controls your breathing, is going to have the easiest time uh, moving if you are, you know, either you know sitting straight or reclining a bit. So this way, your diaphragm will have the full uh, range of motion. Make sure that you're not slumping. You're kind of, you know, you know crunched up somehow, you know, where you're sitting, you know, don't, you know, do your best not to be like, you know, lying down on your stomach (laughs) or something. (laughs) You can lay down on your back or you can recline or you can sit up with your back um, straight. So that will enable your diaphragm to um, move freely. That will enable you to make the best use of the oxygen that you're taking in and it will help you slow down your breathing and be able to extend your um, exhalation. Can we say that this practice is a sibling of mindfulness absolutely i mean uh, this uh, it is a mindfulness practice with the difference that you are rather than just allowing the breath to be as it is you are incorporating that uh, guidance for your breathing so you're allowing your your body to follow the pacer in in guiding itself right so but otherwise, the practice is uh, you know very much the same as what you would do uh, with mindfulness. So you're paying attention to the breath. You are letting the sensations of the breath be as they are. Um, you know, the idea is to let go of any kind of struggle, but rather just you know let your body uh, breathe uh, for you uh, and allow yourself to follow that pacer in a in a mindful way without a struggle. And this is not not that tough exercise to practice. It is easier than meditation for a lot of people who are beginning into mindfulness journey. That can be, it, it can indeed be easier for a number of reasons. One is it gives you something pretty concrete to focus on. So if you are using a pacer, it can just, you know, really something that kind of anchors your attention. That can be uh, helpful for people who um, have who have some trouble with their minds uh, wandering, which by the way, is entirely normal during meditation, but does get better with practice. So this could be a really nice way to start that. Also for people who, uh, may experience you know difficulty with breathing and meditation such as you know lightheadedness or you know shortness of breath or some un- uncomfortable sensations like that this kind of breathing should should help because it said this kind of breathing will also help optimize your carbon dioxide uh, levels which they will then encourage oxygen to get to where it needs to go in optimal levels other guests on my show have recommended three four seven, four, seven, eight techniques. So how this technique is different from other breathing techniques? So the four, seven, eight technique, many people experience as, you know, quite calming. It is, you know, it's very slow, right? If you're doing four seconds, you know, in, you know, um, seven seconds, hold eight seconds um, uh, for the exhalation. It, it's, it's, it's very slow. So, so many people are going to have trouble slowing down that much right away. But those who who are able to slow down uh, will likely will likely enjoy it. One thing I will say is, if we're looking at it strictly from the perspective of training self regulation, um, that the breathing is a bit too slow. The optimal you know breathing rate that will increase our ability to self regulate, so that, that breathing rate that will optimize our heart rate variability is more you know, is closer to that you know four in uh, six out pace. You know for some people it might be yeah you, know, you know five in seven out you know something like that, but it's it's somewhere in in that vicinity. So the four seven eight breathing, uh, while you know a lot of people enjoy it and it's wonderful and can be quite calming, is a, a bit too slow for training training. it is a slow i I, I do that almost every day it can be very slow and when the mind is racing all over the place it gets challenging (laughs) yes yeah so coming back to meditation you guide meditation as well i've seen that on your website and on other resources what kind of meditation do you have in your life personally so i practice mindfulness and self-compassion meditations you know, mindfulness being the ability to just be in the present moment, allowing that moment to be as it is, letting go of judgment, letting go of struggle, and, you know, allowing a a choice for how to respond to that present moment. So do you have, not to interrupt you here, so do you have any mantra based or how does it look like? 
There's a number of mindfulness med- uh, meditation practices that you know that I like and that I teach uh, my clients. Something from as simple as uh, mindfulness of the breath, where you're just paying attention to your to your breath. Uh, now, granted, I usually combine it with heart variability training, but you can do it just by itself, just you know, paying attention to the breath. Um, you can do a practice where you're paying attention to your thoughts, feelings, physiological sensations. So, kind of you know, broadening uh, the scope a little bit. You can do a sound meditation you know, where you're uh, noticing uh, the sounds around you, just kind of taking them in, you know, as they are. You can do eating meditation, such as a piece of chocolate or a raisin. You know, I I personally tend to drink my uh, cup of coffee uh, in the morning uh, mindfully. I really enjoy the smell and taste of <laughs> coffee, you know, in a you know, warm Mindful uh, warm drinking. Beverage. Abs- uh, yes. Well, yeah, yeah, you can, you can, uh, you can absolutely do mindful drinking, not just with coffee. <laughs> you got to be a little careful <laughs> with that. that one. <laughs> but uh, the beauty of mindfulness is you, is you can do uh, anything. The, 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 the only requirement for being mindful is to be, right? It doesn't matter where you are, what you're doing, you can absolutely bring mindfulness to that moment, right? So the only difference is, is it going to be kind of informal mindfulness where you just kind of stop and you know smell the roses or smell the coffee or just observe where you are, or are you going to engage in more formal meditation practice like like I said, the body scan or the sound meditation or at- attending to your emotions or things like that. Yeah. And then you, you can also do self-compassion practices. And this is actually where more of, a, of that mantra um, might come in, where you have certain phrases that you can roll around um, in your mind that you know, remind you to be kinder to yourself, that remind you to be uh, a little more compassionate, you know, treat yourself with a little more care. I love this, you know, how you make this mindfulness and biofeedback sound so simple. (laughs) They actually are. (laughs) They're they're really, they're just just not that complicated. Uh, That's the (laughs) beauty. Pausing and stopping for people isn't easy. You know, when when you set an intention for yourself that this is what you'd like to do, it can, it, well, it, it's easy and it's not, right? Uh, our lives are so busy that, you know, sometimes even taking a minute can be incredibly complicated uh, because we're just moving from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, and getting, you know, running between different things. And uh, even just keeping in mind, oh, wait a second, I got to stop for a minute. Uh, it, it can be in surprisingly complicated. On the other hand, um, if we decide, you know what this is, I am, I am going to uh, build this um, into my day. There's a number of w- ways you can do this that is, you know, fairly simple and will um, build the practice. Once you get into um, the habit of just, you know, stopping even for a minute or two, it will be easier and easier, you know, each day uh, to make these practices be part of your life. So, you know, even if you, you know, put a yellow sticky note on your bathroom mirror with a reminder to breathe, right? And every time you see that bathroom mirror, you know, you take a couple of mindful breaths or, you know, you brush your teeth mindfully every morning, right? I, you know, most of us brush, you know, brush teeth, you know, a couple times a day, right? So, you know, if you brush your teeth mindfully a couple times a day, there you go, you're already establishing a mindfulness practice. Or, you know, if you uh, get yourself a coffee mug that says breathe on it, right? Uh, it will be a reminder to, to be mindful. So there's a number of ways that you can do this that's uh, um, simple to start with. And then as it becomes part of what you do, you can start setting aside um, time for more formal meditation. What's your reminder practice? Well, I will um, honestly tell you at this point, it's just going to become part of my day. There are times when my days get so incredibly hectic that I get to the end of the day and I realize, you know what, I haven't stopped. I haven't paid attention to anything. Um, <laughs> you know, I've just been running, 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 running. And usually it will be at the end of the day when I'm kind of getting you know, ready to, uh, you know, to wind down, go to bed and like, oh, wait, <laughs> you know, I, I, I better, uh, you know, pay attention to just, you know, what's, what's going on right this moment. But most of the time, you know, like I said, you know, that morning cup of coffee is uh, a moment of mindfulness. When um, I'm, you know, spending time with the kids, it's something that I've learned uh, to do mindfully. It uh, both allows me to enjoy spending time with them and it allows me to let go of a lot of stuff that would otherwise, you know, get in the way of having fun with the kids or things that you know might um, annoy or frustrate me are much easier to to move through without getting stuck have you um, have you taught many meditation or mindfulness to your kids 
I have, I have. So when my <laughs> kids were um, younger, uh, and you know, you know, my my youngest is seven, so this is something that she and I do together sometimes. Is a bubble meditation. So, you know, those soap bubbles that you blow. Uh -huh. uh, you can. Uh, that's a beautiful breathing and mindfulness practice because you know you've got to um, breathe out slowly in order to blow those bubbles, right? Uh, so it's a nice uh, breathing practice, and you can pay attention to what does it feel like to blow those bubbles. So if the two people are doing are doing this together, one person is blowing the bubbles and the other one is mindfully observing. So the person <laughs> not busting the bubble. Yeah, but yes, preferably not. That, that, that does tend to ruin the moment. <laughs> Although you, I guess you can burst the bubble mindfully, you know. <laughs> you, you can absolutely have some variations in there. But, you know, if you're choosing to do a mindfulness practice without bursting somebody's bubble, you can... Uh, and the person who is blowing the bubbles can uh, pay attention to the sensations of the breath as they blow the bubble and kind of notice what it's like as that bubble you know, uh, grows and grows and eventually detaches from the wand and then kind of flies off. Uh, and the person who is observing might just notice you know, the size and the color and the number of bubbles that came out, et cetera, and then you switch. And it's a really nice way to you know, spend a little time uh, with your child. It's a really nice way to be mindful together. And it's just a great, great mindfulness practice. And mindfulness leads to enlightenment as well. I was listening to Anthony DeMello this morning. He was Jesuit, Indian Jesuit priest. So somebody asked, a disciple asked a guru how to be enlightened. So guru said, when you just hear, hear. When you just eat, eat. When you just listen, just listen. Yeah. There is nothing. You will be enlightened. <laughs> I don't know if I would say that I've reached enlightenment. Probably not. Or maybe definitely not. But I have uh, absolutely enjoyed those moments of just being, right? Just eating. Uh, just breathing. Just, you know, having a conversation with you. It, it's powerful. Uh, it really um, allows us to move, you know, to move in life with meaning, with, you know, uh, ability to pursue our goals, letting go of unnecessary struggle, letting go of unnecessary um, suffering. And letting go of attachments with things. Absolutely. Yeah, certainly things that we don't need to be attached to. Yeah. And I would love to ask you about your work in U.S. Navy special warfare and U.S. Army special forces. So what did you do with them? <laughs> so I, I, I train the the uh, the navy um, and the army psychologists and some of their uh, special service personnel in improving their performance right the, you know, the army and navy special forces are amazing amazing uh, people some of the most uh, resilient compassionate strong people i've uh, i've ever met and they are very interested in learning how to do what they do better and they are incredibly motivated and uh, they are very open uh, to learning uh, new things so training in biofeedback is something that allows them you know to kind of take math take mastery and take you know really uh, take hold of their own uh, training in the way that is entirely up to them. Uh, and then incorporating mindfulness and self-compassion uh, practices out into their training allows them to further, you know, both the biofeedback training, you know, their own professional athletic, uh, you know, resilience, endurance training, and, you know, also helps them reduce things like uh, the possibility of experiencing trauma or ending up with a long-term PTSD. You talk about coping with a panic attack, anxiety, depression. So what practices did you tell them to Navy and Army folks? Well, so certainly the heart rate variability breathing is something that I teach well to everybody and certainly to the, the Navy and the Army folks. So we, you know, we figure out their ideal you know, breathing rate so that they can uh, train to breathe you know, at that ideal breathing rate and incorporating mindfulness into that. So it becomes mindful, uh, mindful breathing uh, as well as mindfulness techniques such as attending to thoughts, feelings, physiological sensations in the moment 
moment so that you know, they can kind of expand their awareness, you know, not just to the breath, but to the, uh, you know, to other body in mind sensations and, I mean, of things like body scan to be a little bit more aware of what's going on with them physiologically, you know, sound and meditation as a way of being more connected uh, with the outside. Yes, body scan is another mindfulness technique that we can, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a really, uh, it's a really nice one. So what, what I'm understanding from this conversation that there are many ways to becoming better. There are many ways to be good at our performance excellence and just picking up what is working for us and getting support and help from professionals as well. Um, absolutely. Yep. There is a number of, way, uh, number of ways you can do this and you can combine all of those ways, right? You, know, you can um, work with a professional for a bit and then take it uh, on uh, as your own and continue the practice yourself. Yes. Uh, I was going through your Twitter profile and I saw one old tweet that a lot of success in treating migraines mm. with mindfulness-based, cognitive-based therapy and biofeedback. Could you elaborate more on that, please? Certainly. Hey, migraines can be incredibly debilitating. You know, I work with some people who have you know, migraines most of the time. And that, you know, for some people, migraines are something that happens every once in a while. And for other people, it is something that doesn't really you know, let go uh, and is with them most of the time. So the kind of work that I do there is uh, using biofeedback to actually help alleviate some of the dysregulation, uh, the physiological dysregulation that happens um, with migraines. So this actually tends to reduce the frequency frequency and the severity of migraines. So through heart durability and temperature uh, biofeedback. So between the, the two of those, you know, we know from, you know, from research and I know certainly from personal experience working with people that frequency severity and duration of migraines decreases uh, with these biofeedback practices. And then, you know, mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy also allows us to change the way we respond. It helps people who have migraines change the way they respond to the initial, um, you know, indicators that a migraine might be coming on, right? So, you know, what might typically happen is, you know, maybe there are some vision changes or the beginnings of, you know, head pain or, you know, something else that lets the person know that migraine is coming. And very often, and the first reaction is, oh no, this is going to be awful. You know, my day is ruined. I can't, you know, I'm not going to be able to go do anything. Let me, you know, cancel everything that's going on. For people who have, you know, these uh, migraines very often, they tend to not uh, make a lot of plans because they feel like they need to cancel them or they tend to not pursue their goals until, you know, the migraines are better, but migraines don't, you know, don't necessarily, you know, get better. So they, you know, they're their lives and their goals are kind of put on hold. Um, so with mindfulness-based uh, 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 cognitive behavioral therapy in combination with biofeedback, what we're doing is helping people respond differently. You know, if you have pain, to reduce the reactivity, you know, both the reactivity of the body and the mind so that people are able to continue living uh, their lives and move on uh, to the uh, in pursuit of their goals and, you know, be able to, you know, have families and have friends and, uh, you know, spend time with the people they care about, you know, regardless kind of off what the migraine is doing so that you know, they're not getting stuck in that cycle of pain uh, that, you know, the more they avoid, try to avoid pain, uh, the more they struggle, the more pain they feel, you know, the more they try to avoid doing things, which of course only uh, creates more anxiety and more depression and uh, uh, more pain, you know, et cetera. Um, so with uh, mindfulness, uh, um, self-compassion and by feedback techniques to help people kind of get out of that cycle and both uh, improve pain, but very importantly, uh, be able to move on with the kind of life that they want to live. Yeah, that is wonderful. Could you please recommend uh, some online resources or any other resource for mindfulness-based CBT cognitive-based therapy? Certainly, I mean, there is MBCT, Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy. That's uh, um, something that you can find online. I very highly recommend a Mindful uh, Self-Compassion course, so MSC. You can you can find that online uh, as well. So just type in, you know, Mindful Self-Compassion and you will get to their website. This is a program that was started by Christopher Germer and Kristen Neff. And you know, at this point, very well uh, researched, well established and you know, helpful to a lot of people. You know, whether it be struggling, those who are struggling with pain or, you know, migraines or, you know, all sorts of other uh, conditions, you know, anxiety, depression, et cetera. Um, so very highly recommend that. Yes. And uh, I want to ask you some very simple, basic things. <laughs> sure. 
what who is that person that comes to your mind who is happy successful and fulfilled honestly i think it's just a person who is willing to be in the moment the way the moment presents itself uh, and somebody who learns to respond to that moment in the best possible way so somebody who doesn't struggle uh, with the present moment somebody who allows you know challenges to happen somebody who has you know perceives meaning in these challenges and certainly somebody who has a you know has a hard time you know nobody is um, happy all the time that's just really not not possible but somebody who responds to moments of challenge with kindness and with compassion do you know this kind of person in your life <laughs> <laughs> yes yes Absolutely. I'll give you an example of my mentor Christopher Grimmer. I think he is you know very much an embodiment uh, of a person like that. Yes, that is amazing that living we can be happy all the time but happiness becomes a choice moment to moment coming from eastern philosophy. Yeah. And uh, do you have any life philosophy any quote that you live your life by? Um, yeah, I don't know if it's necessarily code, but I do my best to live my life, you know, with kindness, with compassion and with with mindfulness, allowing myself to have my feelings the way they are and responding to them in the way that's most helpful in the moment and allowing people around me to do the same. You have to have their feelings the way they are, sometimes you know helping them respond uh, to those feelings in the best possible way, but really just, you know, respecting uh, every person's experience, validating it, you know, allowing it to be uh, to be real and really kind of starting with that, you know, there is no experience that's invalid. The idea is to respond with kindness and with compassion to whatever the person is going through. Yes, not resisting any feeling and just mm-hmm. sitting with that and allowing yeah. things to happen. What books have you gifted the most in your life? if you have gifted <laughs> <laughs> yes there is a number of them actually one is the mindful path to self compassion by christopher germer another one is the mindfulness solution by ronald siegel and i also really like the a book by kelly mcgonagall uh, the upside of stress upside of stress the upside of stress yes interesting i've never heard of these books <laughs> I highly recommend you check them out. You know, they're all kind of aimed at slightly different uh, parts of what we talk about, but they're all you know, very consistent with allowing yourself to to live in the best possible way. Yep, Christopher Germer, a lot of guests on the show have talked about him in the past. Mm, yeah. Great. Yeah, it's been wonderful conversation with you, Ina, and do you have any suggestion, closing thought or anything? for our listeners. I would you know for, for those people who are interested um in exploring our feed back perhaps establishing a biofeedback practice or learning or establishing a mindfulness practice feel free to um check out uh, my website www.inahazan.com I do have a couple of books uh, that I've written uh, on the topic. The more recent one um, is uh, by Feedback and Mindfulness in Everyday Life: Practical Solutions for Improving Your Health and Performance. Um, and this is a book that uh, describes a lot of what I talked about today. Uh, it's really aimed at um, helping people um, make uh, daily, you know, small uh, daily uh, changes to their habits, incorporating these uh, uh, practices from biofeedback and mindfulness um, into their everyday lives, making them accessible and easy, uh, easy to use. Wonderful. And I will put all these things into the show notes. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Inshallah. Thank you so much. And it was wonderful mindful conversation and i hope that i i i really believe that our listeners will definitely learn so many things from this thing biofeedback was definitely a new thing for me and i'm going to get into more details and maybe i'll contact you for sure that that sounds good i would thank you so much i would welcome that thank you bye bye Thank you for listening to this podcast episode today. If you did enjoy this, please subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcast or you can visit https://nishangarg.me 
n i s h a n t g a r g dot me. You can also share this episode with your loved ones to help them live a fulfilled life. You are not alone in this journey. We all struggle in life. There is no shame in talking about it. I go through my highs and lows. I get depressed, and these practices help me in living a resilient life. You can also do this. You got this. Don't judge yourself. You are doing the best you can. And thank you so much again. Thank you.